after we saw how to uh, handle the types that uh, uh, Julia provided to us, let's now see in this segment how we as the users can create our own types and work with them. And as usual, let's start by running a little bit of uh, stuff to initialize the environment. And we start with the most basic uh, kind of uh, types that are the primitive types. And there's something characteristic of Julia because in Julia, even the primitive types can be defined by the users using this, uh, this syntax here. So I declare a type to be primitive type. I give the name of the type and here is the size in uh, bits uh, and I close with the end keyword. So here I'm defining a new primitive type. How much is uh, the, the size of this, uh, this type? Well, it, this is in bits. So I divide by eight by 1024 and I see here that I'm creating a, um, a type of 100 uh, uh, kilobyte. And the only constraint I have is that th this number determining the size must be a multiple of eight and must be below one megabyte. So there is no other, there isn't any other difference between uh, this type and if I create, if I define a completely uh, new primitive uh, type here, with a different name, sorry what I did. And if I call this one, okay. Now, these two types, the objects of uh, that uh, I instantiate out of these two types will be absolutely the same. There will be no difference between, uh, between them. The only difference is how we are going to use them in the function. So, the difference is given by the API of my program, not, but the characteristics of these two are absolutely uh, the same in terms of type. And then of course, each object will be, will be different. The second uh, kind of, uh, second type of type is uh, the composite type and uh, I do, I declare them with uh, the keyword struct and uh, here we'll see this in the taste, we'll add uh, fields, we'll add the constructors and, uh, uh, but for now just let's see that, so we can have a primitive type, very basic, only the size, uh, the name and the size, a composite type, that can have multiple forms. And then we can have also abstract type uh, with the keyword abstract type. The difference being that abstract types cannot contain any fields. Here I cannot add the fields like in a composite types and they cannot uh, uh, have, is, they can, we cannot have objects to instantiate from abstract types. And, uh, but at the opposite, we can have a, a, a co we can have other types that are declared a child of uh, uh, an abstract type. So the, we use abstract type, the only usage of abstract type, but it's an important usage, is to define a hierarchy of types. Because in Julia, you can uh, have a child of a type only uh, if this type is abstract. You cannot have a child of a, a composite type uh, or a primitive type that are concrete kind of types. So let's see uh, uh, more in detail this composite type. I don't know why they use struct and not composite type because the two are, uh, are synonymous in Julia. So by default here, if I don't put anything uh, before struct, it is an immutable type, that is it. But after I define it, I cannot 
longer change their, their, their component, their fields. So if I want to be able to change the, the one of their fields, I need to declare it as a explicitly as a mutable struct. So here, uh, I'm declaring this composite type foo and not here that I'm using a capital letter. Again, this is a convention. Is I could have called it the uh, foo with a lower letter, but it is convention that the variable start with a lower letter and the capital letter is reserved for uh, um, for the type themselves uh, or uh, for uh, the model names. Here I'm defining three fields to this uh, foo type. The one I'm not specifying what is it. The second one I'm specifying with this annotation to be a string type. And here the field three is another composite type that is the one that we defined here. So we can the fields in this way can refer re, make a reference to other other types. Now we can, with field names here, I can uh, retrieve the list of uh, uh, the, the fields of this specific type. So now is how do I am creating object? How do I instantiate object of this type that I define it here? Well, with the name of the type and under parentheses, I put the object uh, I, that Got get assigned to each field of the type. So here is an integer, here is a string, and here is again I'm creating another object of a composite type. Composite a composite type has no fields, so here there is nothing within the parentheses. And note that the order that you use must be the same as the order where you define the uh, the fields. So and with type of the object, you get the type, uh, uh, well, the type of the object. So this is something not so nice. You have to remember the order. So this is the default constructor that ever when you create a composite type, you get by, by default automatically. And the, it, the default constructor has to follow the order. If you want to use other way to um, to name uh, to, to to input this uh, this uh, parameter, or you want to have some default, or you have some to have some logic so uh, that your object is created only if uh, some uh, some fields are uh, of a certain value. You can use at this time a a custom constructor instead of this uh, automatic constructor that is given here. Custom constructors can be of two type, two well, sorry, can be two type of auto constructor of a type. They can be outer constructors or inner constructor. So let's see first the outer constructor. Well, it is nothing else than a function with the same name as the type that you want to build. So here you create a function, you take the parameters that you want, you apply the logic that you want. For example, here I'm saying because this is foo, he, he doesn't have to, uh, to start with boo, okay, whatever you want. And then what this function must return is the, a call to the uh, automatic constructor, to the default constructor here. So when you build, uh, you, when you use an auto constructor, the auto constructor um, go to call the default constructor that is still available, hence. So here, this time, you can use the default constructor passing the, the parameter of, uh, in the order of the, of the fields as they has been defined in the in the when you define the type or you can use your constructor that you want here for example i'm using positional argument but i could have used the uh, keyword argument or whatever uh, is the case how do i access uh, the fields of my type well i'm using the uh, the dot notation that can be also chained. So if uh, this uh, a composite type would have added some fields itself, I could have used the 
או dot field free dot the name of the field of a composite type. So I'm accessing the field like this. And because I declared this specific type to be mutable, I can also change it. I couldn't do the, this one if I didn't use the keyword mutable. And here is my, my type. Sorry, my, my object. Now, one important thing. If you come from a language like Python or uh, C or Java that are designed under the object-oriented paradigm, well, C++ more than C, you will notice something strange here. You have uh, the properties, what they are called the typically properties of a, of a class. If you compare this one with a class, you have the properties, but you don't have the methods. Where, where are the methods? Well, this is where really Julia uh, shy bec because it generalizes the concept of object-oriented. In object-oriented, you have a class, you have a property, and you have methods that, be, be, that be are owned by that specific class. So you typically have something like uh, uh, something like uh, O and then if I want to have a method show I will write something like that if I am in Python or, or, or similar. This can be rewritten to show O. Okay and what is the difference? Because in the difference is that in uh, object-oriented Pro, uh, languages, this show function will be um, will be dispatched based on the owner of the function. That is, it's like to say as the first argument. But if the uh, the function has uh, several uh, argument, you cannot dispatch over all the possible argument. At least not. Not in runtime, you can do with polymorphism in compilation, but in a runtime, what it matters is only the first argument that is the syntax take this form here, but it's only one argument that is used for dispatch. Instead, we saw in uh, that in Julia, all uh, the uh, type of the argument contribute and determine the dispatch uh, uh, of the correct function. So if we have a different methods of show, these, diff these are uh, different by the different uh, types of the, arg arg of the argument that is called the signature of the function. So signature of the function is given by the name plus the type of all the arguments. And let's gonna take an example here with the show function. So I have my type here. If I have, if I take the object O, I have this representation here. It's just the name of the type and all the the fields. Uh, if I don't like this re representation here, I can override the function show and say and say that the function show that take as first parameter is not the type. It is the input output. Uh, channel where he has to be um, uh, printed. And uh, here, yes, I'm specifying that is this X here must be of type foo. This is my overriding of the show function specific for the type foo. And I'm defining the way I want. So here I say print uh, my custom representation and I print just the first two uh, to uh, fields. And now when I type O, when uh, my object, I have my custom representation the way I defined it uh, here. So you can see here the, the powerful of uh, the multiple dispatch because it can use all the fields to dispatch a function. Now I say that the functions are all uh, outside, so they do not they are not part of uh, of the structure of the 
composite type, there is one single exception that is the constructor. So here we saw the outer constructor, it was just a function with the same name, but we can also create a custom inner construct constructor. Here is the same thing, so I'm defining my mutable structure and I'm defining for uh, this um, for this structure uh, a, um, inner construction and uh, you can see that there isn't much difference except here you can use the keyword uh, new and the difference is that uh, when you use uh, a custom uh, um, uh, inner constructor you, you remove the automatic uh, default constructor so if you don't want to have the if here, for example, I have field one, field two, so I would be tempted to call to use the automatic constructor with just one and my string, but I will get an error here because the default constructor has been uh, removed by the fact that I'm using a custom uh, inner constructor. And one other thing, so when you write, uh, you, you define a, a structure, these are fixed in Julia for the whole program, and this is a bit a limit because you cannot create, this is why I changed the, the name, because you cannot create another structure full to with uh, whatever, with uh, Okay, here we'll have an error because uh, he will say that foo true already exists and is a constant and I cannot redefine it. So the only, you have several ways to mitigate uh, uh, this problem or you have to restart Julia when you come on these problems. So when you are developing a program, you have to put attention to use, uh, uh, to first the well defining the structure because every time you change them, uh, you have to restart Julia. There are, you can use uh, um, modules, so instead of putting the structure here, you can put your structure in a separate modules, so you change uh, the, the module um, instead of working directly in the, in the main module. But it's still something that uh, it would preferable if you could uh, change the structures. In general, if you do not apply any mitigation technique, uh, changing names, uh, you have to, to restart uh, Julia every time you change the definition of, um, of a structure.